Welcome to Hope Talks, where we share inspiring stories of hope in Jesus Christ. Hope Talks is hosted by Pastor Margaret Michael and Grayson Willis. Join us for uplifting stories of triumph, faith, and the enduring power of Christ's love. Also, if you're in the listening area, tune into 1470 AM or 102.1 FM WBTX to listen to Hope Talks every Sunday at noon. Welcome to today's broadcast of Hope Talks. I'm Grayson Willis. And I'm Pastor Margaret Michael. Thank you all for joining um, us today and those that are listening. And today we're joined in the studio by Nicole Wright. Nicole, welcome. Thank you. Yeah, it's good to have you with us today. Um, We are looking forward to um, hearing your story. Um, Nicole is um, our champion volunteer around the church. Nicole has a heart um, to serve and serves in many different capacities. And so today it's good just to be able to sit at the table with you and hear a little bit about um, your story and um, maybe why you're passionate about the things you're passionate about. So Mm -hmm. um, today we'll just start out with asking you a little bit about like where are you from, where you grew up. Okay. Um, Well, I was born in Southern California uh, in 1985 and we lived in California for a while um, until I was about eight-ish, and then moved to the East Coast, uh, probably about 93. Uh, we lived in Maryland and then wound up in Fredericksburg, Virginia, out in Spotsylvania County at my grandparents' house. So Okay. So tell us a little bit about what it was like for Nicole growing up. Yeah, that smile tells me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. A little bit. Um, so uh, my mother was a single parent. Like I had mentioned earlier, we moved around a lot. Uh, she had some pretty significant mental health struggles, and um, I think partially related to that also had a pretty bad drinking problem. Um, we lived with her parents on and off until I was about kindergarten or first grade age. Uh, just moved a lot as a result. She was actually a registered nurse for um, the neonatal intensive care units was her specialty, um, but those jobs were... I don't want to say frequent and far between at the same time, but they just really didn't last long. Like she'd get on somewhere and just due to some other struggles, I just really couldn't keep them for various reasons. Uh, A lot alcohol related, a lot of interpersonal stuff, I'm sure. Um, I have some memories of it, but not a lot of like the reasons why. But as a result of not being employed or just different things, you know, we'd we'd get a house, um, often only have the lease, I guess would be the word for about a year. And then, you know, there'd be an eviction or we'd be moving on for whatever reason. She obviously came up with other reasons. Um, But as I got older, I realized, you know, a lot of it was the increasing substance use as well as untreated mental illness. I don't know if it was because it was the 80s or just mental health wasn't really as talked about Yeah. when I was very young. I like the phrase, I learned it here. You know, we had lumpy rugs. So Mm -hmm. when things would happen, you know, I thank God for my grandparents because they would step in. They, I can't even begin to fathom how much stuff they paid for with us. Um, But, you know, it just wasn't really addressed. It was like, you know, the issue would be brought up, but God forbid it came into public lighters. Oh, there's nothing wrong. We're the perfect little family. And it got swept under the rug. So I think we had the lumpiest drugs in town. Mm. But I also think that contributed to the worsening of my mother's issues because it wasn't dealt with. Um, right. You know, if, if mental illness isn't diagnosed or treated, I mean, I'm no expert, but like any other illness or sickness, if it's not treated or addressed, either medically or therapeutically, it progresses. That's right. Especially the ones she had. So biggest issue was that growing up. So that caused the moving around a lot. Uh, Some bad relationships. She was very clingy with me, um, I think, out of a fear of rejection maybe or um, something to do with she did have some delusions. So, you know, maybe something to do with that. Um, As a result, really didn't have a lot of friends, you know, not a lot of good relationship example, I guess. Um, So I was kind of the mean little poor kid that didn't have anything to do with anyone. I learned that as a coping mechanism early and kept it well into adulthood. So, and then, you know, long story short, we moved to Virginia after Maryland and uh, it was probably around middle school. um, And we lived with my grandparents off and on through that. 
And then, you know, her stuff continued. Um, the mental illness, the drinking, that's when I actually uh, was used to steal it for her because alcohol gets expensive, even the bad wine. So that created a lot of issues. Yeah. Uh-huh. So your grandparents, it sounds like they were there for you and provided a lot for you during those years. They did, yes. Um, I honestly don't know where I'd have been without them, even after those years and into adolescence and early adulthood. Yeah. So was the church ever a part of your story? Um, like, kind of. That's kind of a two-edged sword with that. And it's probably a bad analogy to make, but my grandparents were Lutheran. Uh, my grandmother was born two weeks after her family got off the boat from Germany. Mm. She was a surprise, like me. Mm. Um, but so she raised her family and my grandfather did as well, of course. So we went to Lutheran churches. I remember sitting in the hardwood pew and saying the same thing over and over again. So I knew about God. I knew who Jesus was. You know, I, I knew all the Bible stories, things like that, but religion kind of was an uncomfortable thing for me because some of, without going to detail, some of the uh, delusions my mother had were related to seeing, you know, angels or things like that, just as we're speaking. You know, so, you know, while I I fully believe God speaks to us in different ways, depending on the person, that wasn't God speaking. It was it was the mental illness. Um, We often church hopped as well, because that's how you get money. Mm. Um, And I don't fault her for any of it, but she was trying to survive. Yeah, it was a surviving mechanism. Um, So I think we tried Baptist, Methodist, pretty much everything else. So. Church really didn't become a thing for me till into adolescence, uh, early teenage years. Yeah. And what, during those years, how did church then become a real part of your life, I guess? <laughs> so it's another funny story. My aunt and uncle got custody of me when I was about 13, yeah, July 5th of 99. So I'd have still been 13. Um, I was actually put into something called kinship care, which basically is just a, a blood relative takes custody. Um, and we were told, uh, their youngest son and I were told that we were going to church. And being the lovely teenager I was, um, I was like, no, I'm not. Because just to be honest, some of my early experiences with church weren't great. Uh, we had often gotten kicked out because of my mom's issues and just other things. Um, So we actually went to Salem Fields Community Church in Fredericksburg, probably around 2000, 2001. And that was pivotal for me after I got over the initial, I'm not doing it attitude. So was there anybody specifically there that impacted you? Yeah. Uh, I think the first people I met was uh, Buddy and Gay Marston. Um, And then of course, Chris Meek was our youth pastor at the time. Um, he, unbeknownst to me at the time, he was also the football coach at my high school. Cause once my aunt and uncle got custody, um, my grandparents had had it briefly. Let me back up. And that situation didn't work. So I went to my aunt and uncle's. So I had to switch high schools my sophomore year and I wound up at Cortland and he was our football coach. So, but yeah, they definitely had a big impact on me. Yeah. 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 I saw that smile. Yeah come across your face <laughs> and those people are... listening can't see that but yeah. i saw that that hope that just appeared in your face yeah. when you said their names yeah and those are names we're familiar with Absolutely. here even in Small harrisonburg world. being that buddy is from rockingham county and chris also served here as a youth pastor uh, chris meek mm-hmm. served here he i know he came my junior year and was here through part of the time i was in college away at college so um, it's just funny how small the world is. Yeah, hundred mile difference between yeah. the two places, and yet the connectedness. Yeah, and Buddy's dad shows up yeah. here every Sunday. every Sunday for church. His dad yeah. is actually the first mechanic that fixed my car when I first oh, wow. moved up here. Wow. So, how did that impact you um, finding a church, uh, a community of people that? engaged you uh, obviously you saw Chris at church and you saw him at school and what was that like I mean at first it was kind of unfamiliar because I'd always kind of kept my distance you know if I learned early that if I don't let anybody in they can't hurt me mm-hmm. um, if I'm in control nobody else is in control so they can't they can't hurt me um, but buddy had this saying and who I call my adoptive sister and I always talk about it was He'd be at the doors greeting, 
Um, and he'd give both of us hugs and say, I love you guys. And just hearing that was amazing. Mm. Um, and then we had gotten involved in the youth group. Um, my cousin and I attended. Uh, we're only three weeks apart, so we were always in the same grade. And, um, you know, that's where I kind of learned a lot more about personal relationship with Jesus. Like, which, again, I knew who Jesus was. I knew what he did. But I hadn't really had that relational aspect of it. And that was very helpful through some tough years in high school. Yeah. So it helped you to build a firmer foundation in those years. It was another layer, right? Yeah, another layer. (laughs) So you talk about going to Salem Fields and being involved in the church Mm -hmm. there. How did you end up in Harrisonburg? Or what brought you to Harrisonburg? (laughs) Okay, so um, I graduated high school early at 17. And I got into JMU. And at that point, I just wanted out of the house. I was done. I don't blame my aunt and uncle. It's just it was a tough situation. I was really damaged, I guess, at that point. I didn't know how to relate. Like, it was just a really complicated situation. So I came to JMU in 03 uh, for college and pretty much just stayed in the Valley because I didn't really want to go back to Fredericksburg. Were there anything in those years that was significant, like that impactful? You came to Harrisburg, you went to JMU, and... Yeah. So I mentioned earlier, I call her my adoptive sister. I wasn't legally adopted. I wasn't legally adoptable because I was in kinship care. Um, But I had met Jess probably around 2000, 2001 at high school. We were both the new kid. And then we met more formally, I guess you'd say, at Salem Fields in the youth group. Um, And her parents uh, became kind of like a mom and dad. I'll never forget, I went in and I said, hi, Mr. and Mrs. Robertson, how are you? Because that's how I was raised to speak to my elders. And they said, um, it's Neil and Sue or mom and dad. Um, so that was another, yet another layer of, I'd say, provenient grace, really. So, yeah. And we stayed connected over the years. She went to Liberty. She was a year behind me in school. Um, so, you know, kind of had college. I did not do well in college. A lot of stuff happened. I just, I don't think I was ready. And at 17, given my background and then, you know, my mother lost custody, all that family stuff. I had no idea how to study. I didn't have coping mechanisms. Um, and honestly, I don't think at 17, anybody really knows what they want. So true. It was just my ticket out. Um, so I actually failed out of college, uh, got my first apartment tiny place over on 42 um and stayed um but my biological mother passed away september of 04 i was a sophomore i'd have been about a sophomore she died of alcoholic cirrhosis and i think that just floored me like it set me back and i just didn't didn't know how to deal with it i didn't have those tools yeah so that kind of started some of the spiral but yeah you survived I yeah. did. Um, so you ended up here at some point? Yeah, I actually tried coming here a couple times and just, I don't want to say I didn't connect because everybody here at this church has always been loving and welcoming and awesome, frankly. But I think I just had my own stuff to work through. I guess I wasn't ready yet. I don't know if that's the right phrase. So yeah, I just kind of, there was a counselor I saw years and years ago, in my early 20s, that said, you know, you've survived so long, and now you need to learn how to thrive. Mm. So I think I survived. Yeah. Like, I just lived. Yeah, one day to the next. Yeah, I mean, I functioned. I got up. I went to work, paid my bills, but I was pretty pretty empty. Yeah, yeah. So how did that change? So, and I know now it wasn't an accident. <laughs> Margaret and I have had this conversation. <laughs> so I used to do... Um, I guess you call it travel event marketing. So I traveled a lot, used 81 a lot. And I had um, bought my place. I live at now in Port Republic. Um, so I always took the interstate exit on, I think that's 245. And so I'd pass this church all the time and they had the board up and, you know. But one time I noticed that it said celebrate recovery and that there was a serve. I thought it was a church service, a weekday church service because... I was working weekends because that's when most home shows and festivals are. And 
So I came in and I was like, okay, I, I think I knew I needed to get back to church. I think subconsciously, like I, I don't ever remember thinking, like, oh, you got to get your stuff together. You got to get back to church. You got to get back to Jesus. But, you know, I think the spirit leads where he will. And I walked in the doors and I met Pastor Margaret and Pearl Parks. Mm-hmm. Two good night. people to meet. Yeah, yeah. I remember that night. Yep, six years ago. But I know now that was, di- I'll call it divine appointment. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, the Lord, um, you talked about prevenient grace and, you know, his desire is for us to, to know him and to be in relationship with him from the time we're born until throughout life, like he draws us. There's nothing in us that can really find him. He finds us. Right, right. He right, comes yeah. and meets us where we are. Sometimes yes. even when we don't expect him, because I certainly did not. Yeah. I had kind of given up on going the whole going to church thing, and I tried a couple other churches in the area. Um, just didn't feel like a lot of stuff was biblical. I just I didn't feel comfortable. Like I think some stuff might have been false. I I don't know. Yeah. I just I knew I didn't need to be there, so I didn't stick with it. I learned another lovely coping mechanism when I was younger. If you don't like something, don't bother with it. So I just okay, I quit. Yeah. You know, I didn't really stick with stuff. But yeah, that changed coming here. Yeah, and that's amazing that that was, at one time, was a part of who you were, that you didn't stick with things, because the Nicole I know sticks with things. So how did that happen? Um, God's grace, honestly, celebrate recovery. You know, when I found out, just to be honest, when I found out it was a recovery ministry, my first thought was, oh no, it's going to be like AA and Al-Anon again. And I'm, I'm not speaking down on those programs. I think they serve an excellent purpose. Um, I know plenty of people that AA has really been helpful with. But again, my younger experiences, I was like, well, I'm not an addict. And then I learned, you know, Celebrate Recovery and recovery in general isn't just for somebody addicted. It's for everybody. You know, we all have a hurt, habit, or hang up at some point. If we don't have one now, we will soon. True. Um, so it was just... Killing the layers off the onion, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. And what do you think was like your greatest aha in Celebrate Recovery? Like what really, what was a light bulb that come on? Because you came here, you weren't an addict. Um, Matter of fact, you were determined not to be one, right? Very much so, yes. Because you had watched that in your own home. So when did you, like what was that light for you? I mean... You know, I, I came and I still had the defense mechanism of, you know, you don't let the walls down. I like to use the analogy of a brick wall. If you put a brick wall high enough, nobody can see in. I got very good at, very early on, not being an open book. Like, just let people know just enough, but not let them know the real me. And I don't know. I think it was a God thing. It's just, I don't remember what night it was, but it was like the walls came down. Like, I was safe. And I felt comfortable enough, which for me is a huge thing. I felt comfortable enough to just, you know, start tearing down the wall, so to speak. And once that happened, it took a while. Um, But that's exactly what I needed. Yeah. I think I just needed that relational aspect like we talked about earlier. In a safe place where I would learn that I wasn't judged as too damaged or too far gone. Yeah. Where you found hope, you heard stories of other people who yeah. found hope, and I think that helps. Um, around here, we're all about stories of hope because we know we we all need to hear yeah. that other people on the journey are having uh, victories, and yeah. you know, Amen. and so that's really an important part of celebrate recovery, right? Like we celebrate mm-hmm. those uh, places of recovery, um, hearing from others, and then learning how to walk up to think differently yeah yeah that's a big part of it i think was just kind of changing the way i thought as margaret says stinking thinking Mm -hmm. um you know i think i got into just kind of a negative mindset of you know well life sucks because for me it it did yeah um that doesn't mean that good stuff didn't happen because it did god had his provenient grace there, you know, Mm. putting people in my life in situations. But I think I just got, it's almost like being cold, but it's not like temperature cold because I actually love the cold. Mm. (laughs) Um, But it's like 
soul cold where mm-hmm. it's just the negativity's there and i think one of the most pivotal things for me was just getting out of that mindset and maybe seeing the good and developing those relationships and coping tools of dealing with it when bad stuff happens because mm-hmm. it does yeah. we're still going to struggle that's yeah. human yeah. yeah you know i i remember you and i meeting one night and having dinner yeah remember that you let some walls down that night I, yeah and, i did yeah and i think that takes a lot of trust you know mm-hmm. it takes a lot to, to go, you know what i think i trust enough that i can do this yeah for mm-hmm. me that's huge yeah but it's a journey you know yeah. it's it's not something that happens overnight but mm-hmm. it's it's a journey and and you've been here you you've came to a place of healing and you've stepped in um we don't have probably enough time to talk about all the places uh-huh. that you've volunteered. But talk to us a little bit about just how you're involved within the church. From coming in that night not knowing that you wanted to be a part ever, right. really, and to now, what's it look like for Nicole to be a part of the church? Okay. So I'll go back to briefly just with having walls up. I think one of the most important things I learned was just being in community. Like, isolating is easy because then people don't know what we go through. Um, So like I said before, you know, eventually walls came down, feelings came out, the good, the bad, the ugly, and oh my goodness. And I knew that I still felt loved and accepted, and I wasn't rejected. Because see, my whole life, in many aspects, I had felt that. But once I met people here that loved me for me, that made all the difference in the world. Um... And I think I just, I feel led to share that with others. Um, you know, I, I hope, I know people are going to experience hurt and trauma. Like, mm-hmm. that's going to happen. I don't want people to experience half of what I have. But I also had to learn that in my own mind, if I could take the pain away, I would. But yeah. I can't. I know I can't. So maybe I can help people develop the tools to be able to do that. You know, and recognize that they're not, not alone. Um, and by having that relationship with Christ, which I had the background of at Salem Fields, but I kind of walked away, I kind of rekindled that here. Mm-hmm. And just that feeling of hope and healing, I was home. Yeah. And I want other mm-hmm. people to feel that, yeah. even with some more recent stuff, you know. Yeah. And that's where I kind of got plugged in. You know, I did CR for a while. I actually joined a life group uh, before I joined the church. I didn't officially join the church till COVID when we reopened which was what, like 2021, I think. Um, Yeah, and then just got into serving because I wish I could tell my grandmother she was right. Um, But she used to always say, blessing others blesses you, and it it really does. I mean, over the years, it's resulted in a career change. Um, I, five, six years ago, I'd have never thought I'd be where I am now. So, Yeah, Um, I just see your compassion for children. Um, as you serve um, with our celebration place, with our kids, um, I see you um, driving sure. the van um, and bringing people in. Um, I see you serving at Hope Distributed. Um, with the youth at our East Rock campus, and also you serve online I do. once a yeah. month. So. Um, you truly are a, a servant, and just so many of the areas that you serve. I hear your story, and I have a feeling that you see others yeah. through those. Yeah, I think, again, I wouldn't wish my past on anybody, but I think God brings purpose to our pain. Another mm-hmm. Margaretism is God doesn't waste a hurt. Yeah, <laughs> right. So, you know, with that, I think sometimes it gives me a different perspective. You know, I, I think it's it's normal for people to be uncomfortable around things they don't. They're not used to it. They didn't experience. But I come from a place where we struggled for food, where, you know, things maybe didn't function well. I mean, when I was a child, we had periods of homelessness where we slept in a car. So it doesn't bother me. If anything, I think it kind of feeds me spiritually. And, you know, and just that I can show that grace and that some of that unconditional love um, the first Bible verse I learned was 1 Corinthians thirteen thirteen. And these three things remain faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. And I know how important that was in my own journey of healing, and I still have bad days. It's okay to not be okay. Yeah. That only becomes a problem when you get stuck in it, and I got really stuck in it. Um, but yeah, so just 
to share that with others. Um, and I think that's my calling. I, I don't know exactly what that is yet, which for me is terrifying because I like having a plan and sticking to the plan and sticking to a schedule. Um, but yeah, just seeing where it goes. Yeah. But I've watched as you've really leaned in and um, even to the point of you help lead a grief and trauma group um, where you become hope for others who are not yeah. as far along. Yeah, we all still have work to do. Oh, you yeah. know, we all still, until we reach glory, we will have work to do on this earth. We will not have arrived. But um, I just see you um, providing hope to others in many situations. And yeah. um, when, you, when I hear your story, it helps me to understand uh, your desire to serve children and teens and people that need uh, food and people that need a van ride. And um, sometimes I think we can, and I heard someone say they, they would see, they would go around and pick people up, but they saw themselves getting on the bus. Yeah. Yeah. That that's similar. It's like, I can see everybody's journey is different. I mean, even two people that experience the same thing. So true. Uh, feel it differently and experience it differently. We all have different lenses, but it's like I could see a little bit of myself in that and how blessed am I that I'm not stuck in that anymore. Right? Like yeah. I was told from early on, oh, you know, your parents were alcoholics. You, you know, you're genetically predisposed to these mental illnesses. You're this, you're that, you're guaranteed to be this. Mm-hmm. Well, by God's grace, I'm not. Right. I have my own struggles, yeah. but... I want to share that. I should say I feel led to share that grace with others because that's not how we should live. God gives us the ability. We just have to do the work. I, you don't, I don't have to pull myself up by my bootstraps. That's right. You have to be willing to put in the effort, and it is tough work. Let me tell you, when you do that first inventory and celebrate recovery, <laughs> yeah. it is torture, but it's yes. worth it. Yes. But we don't have to do it alone. That's right. God gives us the power and the ability. Yeah. He does for sure. Yeah. Um, Nicole, um, just in closing, kind of two questions, but it could sure. be the same. Anything that you would like to share in regards to your testimony that we haven't asked you already? And then also after that, uh, what brings you hope right now in your life? Since this program is called Hope Talks, what brings you hope? Just, I really struggled with rejection a lot. And it, I don't blame it on any one person. Like the stuff my mother struggled with, I don't fault her. You know, I never did. Um, but just that, you know, the past doesn't determine my future. Right. Um, there was something I heard during parking lot church. I used to joke it was a sermon in a suntan. <laughs> um, you know, just uh, Pastor Adrian just said, you know, as long as there's breath in your lungs, God's not done with you right. yet. And that your past has no more power than you give it. So just rely on that. Like, I'm not, da- I don't want to downplay the effect, especially really traumatic stuff can have on us because it, it leaves a mark. Those wounds don't fully heal, right. but we learn to deal with them and with Christ in our lives in a, a place like this. That's really, really helpful. Um, and, you know, just that rejection only has the power we give it. And the God, there's another Adrian sermon, I'm sure, um, you know, rejection can be really painful but nobody can reject us the world can't reject us any more or any less than we allow it and god will never reject us you know he accepts us fully um and i just i want to share that with people that might feel hopeless right yeah powerful as long as there's breath there's hope and if there's anybody listening today that feels hopeless you know I, i think about your story nicole God led you to the right place. Mm-hmm. And if we're open and um, we ask him, I believe that he will lead those listening to the right place as well. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Because he He has never forsaken us. Right. He's never lost sight of us. Um, and he pursues every one of us. Um, and so I'm very grateful for that and grateful that, uh, that you ended up here right. and yeah. Yeah. Uh, a part of the fabric of our community. Um, It's been a pleasure to have you with us today. Nicole, thank you for joining us. Thank you for listening to today's broadcast of Hope Talks. We pray that as you've heard Nicole Wright's testimony today, that it truly has been a half hour of hope for your life. 
May God bless. Hope Talks is sponsored by Church of the Nazarene in Harrisonburg in partnership with Sunshine Ministries. If you enjoyed today's episode, make sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a review on Spotify or Apple Podcast. Your feedback helps us spread hope to even more listeners. Stay tuned for more uplifting stories in the next episode. Until then, keep the faith, share the love, and find joy in the hope that Jesus Christ brings.